Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to start off by thanking uh, Matthews and IPS for the kind invitation for me to come and speak to you. Um, in some ways, I have the easiest job to do because I'm sure that uh, Singaporeans know Malaysia very well. So basically, I'm just uh, giving a summary of, of, of the latest trend in Malaysia, especially what I call the rise of political Islam. So basically, what I want to do in my 15 minutes is basically talk about the sources of political Islam in Malaysia. And I think it's important that we identify the sources as uh, coming from two areas. One is the formal sources, but I think a lot of people, when they look at Malaysia, they forget about the informal source of political Islam. Then I want to talk a bit about the pressure points, uh, why it is so difficult to deal with this issue, and finally, I'll provide a very brief summary of what I think. So I'd like to start off by saying that when I talk about political Islam here, I'm not really talking about Islam as a religion, but I'm really talking about politicians in Malaysia who are using Islam to mobilize the polity, specifically the Muslim community there. Basically, these politicians are using Islam as the only platform to gather support from the Muslim community and the wider Malaysian community. So when I talk about the former sources of political Islam, I think the starting point really has to be the Malaysian constitution. I think if you look at it closely, no matter how you come up, whether you're a constitutional lawyer, political scientist, or even a layman, in terms of the Malaysian constitution, you really can't separate the Malay identity with Islam. Uh, part of it has got to do with the fact that it's written very clearly in the constitution that you know, if you are a Muslim in Malaysia, you're also a Malay, and there's no way around it. The other problem is, in the Malaysian Constitution, it says very clearly that Islam is the religion of the federation, but the problem is that very often the second part is not taken into account. So what you have is, Islam is the religion of the federation, but other religions may be practiced in peace and harmony in any part of the federation. But the problem in Malaysia is that very often, people only talk about the first part of the sentence, which is Islam is the religion of the federation. And in practice, they take it to mean that Islam is actually the official religion. Now, I would argue that if this is the case, the framers of the constitution who made it very clear that Islam is the official religion, but they did not use the phrase. They used the phrase that Islam is the religion of the federation. Thus, what we have in Malaysia from the constitutional viewpoint is that a Malay is equal to a Muslim, equals to a special position because Islam is the uh, uh, religion of the federation, and therefore, the thinking is that Islam is also the official religion. In other words, being a Malay means that you are higher than all other peoples of Malaysia. And this is reinforced by all the major Muslim majority political parties in Malaysia. And of course here, I'm talking about AMNO, the former ruling party who's been in power for 61 years. I'm also talking about past party Islam Malaysia, for the name alone is very clear where they stand. And of course the new ruling party in Malaysia, Besatu. Now, looking back in history or contemporary history, we really have to look at the role of AMNO. AMNO was basically the de facto ruling party in Malaysia, despite the fact that officially they called themselves the Malay Alliance and after that the Barisan National. But in actual practice, they were basically the ruling party. They don't really care about what the other component parties in the ruling coalition wants. Now, when you talk about the rise of political Islam, you really have to look back in the 1980s. And the starting point really has to be 1981, when Mahathir came into power. Mahathir very early on knew that he really had accumulated a lot of political power because he was a man in a hurry. Um, I always regarded Mahathir as a true nationalist. He really wanted to develop Malaysia and make sure Malaysia was a fully developed country. And he understood that in order to do that, he really needed to accumulate uh, real political power. And he also saw correctly during the 1980s that his major threat to his uh, accumulation of power, of course, was party Islam Malaysia. And therefore, to play the game in order to beat pass, he really had to bring in Islam. And he did this in a very clever way. He looked around and see who was the person who can really mobilize the Islamic ground. And of course, the answer was Anwar Ibrahim. So that's the reason why he brought Anwar Ibrahim into government. And he inserted Islam into the public administration of the country. But more importantly, during his first term in government, he established a lot of Islamic-related institutions. I don't want to go through the list, but the major ones is such as the Islamic University, Islamic Banking. But probably the most important element that he introduced or establishment uh, uh, institution that he established was, of course, JAKIM, which is the Department of Islamic uh, Development in Malaysia. 
Now, what is really interesting about Jakim is that since then, Jakim has accumulated a lot of power. Uh, if you speak to people in Malaysia, especially in civil service, they will tell you that Jakim really is a special part of the civil service. They have lots of autonomy, and essentially, they do what they want. But the really important thing about Jakim is that they're trying to promote this idea of a Malay Islamic State. Now, this is really, really interesting because those of you who know anything about Islam know that Islam has no racial character. But they're trying to build this idea that you know, in Malaysia, the situation is unique and that we're trying to build this thing called a Malay Islamic State. The other really important thing about Jakim, of course, is that they're trying to bureaucratize Islam. Again, this is, uh, I'm not saying it's unique to Malaysia, but the way Jakim has gone about it is quite interesting because they come up with all sorts of rules and regulations. Now, I'm, talking, I'm not only talking about personal behavior, but they're talking about rules and regulations that covers every facet of Muslim life. So one of the unusual things you'll find in the civil service, say compared to the 60s and 70s in Malaysia now, is that uh, many departmental heads in Malaysia, uh, in government service in Malaysia now, uh, you, are put, you are put under tremendous pressure to organize religious stuff, which did not happen before. Okay? So the end game is that you create sort of an intolerant climate, as the speakers in the first panel has mentioned, the idea of us versus others. But this comes from the bureaucracy itself within the government. So I think we have a problem there, and the attitude is that you know, it's us against them. And as the speakers in the first panel has mentioned, uh, the major targets are people who disagree with them or who don't go along with the idea of a Malay Islamic State, which is the own Muslim community. But also, there's also a lot of intolerance over the non-Muslim population in Malaysia. And I'm sure you all know, uh, Malaysia, almost one-third of the population are actually non-Muslims. Now, moving very quickly on to the role of PAS. Now, PAS, as the name suggests, Party Islam Malaysia, has always had this idea of trying to create Negara Islam from day one. So they've always used Islam as a platform to mobilize support in the Malay community. Now, what is really interesting about uh, uh, PAS is that during the time when Mahathir began to assert himself as an Islamic leader, right, uh, PAS began to create all sorts of fringe groups and supported all sorts of NGOs in Malaysia as long as these Islamic NGOs went against the government. So today, if you look at PAS, right, what is really interesting about PAS is not so much their Islamic party, but their extensive links. If you look at the leadership of PAS, you find that many of the leaders of PAS have extensive links with Islamic NGOs. And a lot of them actually, uh, you know, uh, before they enter PAS, they were actually uh, founders of these NGOs. So the end game of this uh, competition between AMNO and PAS, I would argue, is that they basically push the Malay party to the right. There's no other, other, other space in the Malay party in Malaysia other than being an Islamic champion. So that's the former part, political parties government, the ruling party. Now the really interesting part, and this is an area that's been understudied in Malaysia, is the informal pressure of political Islam in Malaysia. And this is the rise of Islamic NGOs. Now one of the key speakers in the first session talked about Saudi Arabia pouring a lot of money overseas. And Malaysia is one of the countries in Southeast Asia that's actually received a lot of this money. Uh, this money went to individuals. A lot, of the, a lot of Malaysians actually receive a lot of scholarships to study in Saudi Arabia. Uh, we know quite a number of them when they came back, they set out their own private madrasa. Uh, some of them got involved with Salafi and Wahhabi teachings. Um, I don't want to go into details, but the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, a lot of these things about the rise of political Islam in Malaysia, not only from the government side, but the informal side, there's an external dimension to it. Uh, in recent years, a lot of this influence actually come from uh, preachers, uh, especially those who are trained from the Indian subcontinent, places like Pakistan. Uh, they've come back and they've become very, very influential. And part of it, of course, is the rise of social media. So one of the interesting television programs in Malaysia is that you know, they went out and have a competition about who is the uh, you know, young ulama, who is the best young ulama around. And if you watch the programs carefully, you see that a lot of them are actually very adept in using social media. So after four decades of all these uh, uh, investments in Islam, in political Islam, what do you get? Uh, the end result really now is that uh, Islamic identity in Malaysia is now much stronger than the Malay identity. Uh, many, many surveys in Malaysia have shown that if you ask the young Malays in Malaysia, right, would you call yourself a uh, Malay Muslim or Muslim Malay? Uh, many of them will actually say that I'm a Muslim first uh, rather than a Malay. And this is a drastic change, say, from the uh, 60s, 70s, and early 80s. Uh, increasingly, a small minority of them, and the numbers are growing uh, bigger and bigger every year, is that uh, they reject 
the sort of government system we have in Malaysia. Uh, they want an Islamic state. Uh, many of them do not accept the current mainstream political process in Malaysia. Um, the other important thing is that because of the nature of the rise of political Islam, right, uh, no Malay politicians today will talk about less Islam in the state. In fact, every politician is talking about infusing more Islam into the state system. Uh, the increasing uh, dimensions of, of political Islam, especially the spread of Wahhabi and Salafi teachings in Malaysia, is a real worry. Uh, my, my colleagues who does work in this area tell me that you know, it's, it's quite incredible that if you go to some of these private madrasa, right, even the state itself, I'm talking about the Malaysian state, and I'm talking about including Jakim, right, they don't really know what is actually being taught, especially in terms of the curriculum. Uh, the other worrying thing is that the state in Malaysia, the Malaysian state, no longer confront these groups. Uh, they will only confront them if, for example, uh, you know, if they start talking about taking up arms or going to Syria or joining ISIS, and that's on national security grounds. Or if they are part of a narrative which doesn't fit into the idea of a Malay Islamic state, uh, things like the Shah teaching and all that sort of thing. If they do this sort of thing, the state will take action against them. Other than these two areas, I don't see the Malaysian state doing anything about them. Uh, the other side issue, which I think is very important in what we're discussing today in terms of identity politics, is that the rise of political Islam in Malaysia has also created a backlash among the non-Muslim population. So you see that the non-Muslim population in some ways are also getting more religious. And this is especially true of the younger Christians in Malaysia. Uh, they, they are getting themselves involved with evangelist uh, uh, Christian groups in Malaysia. So what are the pressure points that we're talking about when we talk about Malaysia? Um, I think the first thing is, as I mentioned earlier, is that who actually controls the Islamic bureaucracy? Uh, this is an interesting question because going back to the constitution, it says very clearly, in the states where there's a sultan, the sultan is actually the ultimate authority on the Islam. So this means that there are questions raised even within the Islamic community in Malaysia as to whether Jakim is legitimate. Uh, there are lots of Islamic scholars in Malaysia today who argue that you know, Jakim is actually not legitimate because Jakim is trying to take powers away from the Sultan. Uh, this is the reason why there are lots of issues dealing with the standardization of things like fatwa. Uh, for example, the National Fatwa Committee, uh, at the state level, some they do not agree with it. There is also... Uh, worrying in terms of creating a permanent pool of students who have very, very limited contact with the non-Muslim population. And there are many people who are worried that they, this, this pool of students, especially the private madrasa, uh, they, are, they are already pool of recruits for some of the radical teachings that are coming through on social media, also from the individual preachers. The other pressure point I think uh, very often people forget is that uh, a lot of these things happening in Malaya is not happening in Sabah and Sarawak. And in Sabah and Sarawak, I can tell you from personal experience that a lot of the people, the population, especially the indigenous non-Malay population, the non-Muslim Bumutra population in Sabah and Sarawak are very worried about this. Uh, a lot of them, um, you can tell the way they talk, the sort of the narrative they put out on social media. Um, they sort of are very worried about this, and there are political implications. So the example of a political implication coming out of this rise of political Islam is that uh, for the very first time since the 1980s, right, uh, the ruling party in Sabah and Sarawak are not members of Pakatan Harapan. Uh, they're not part of the federal government. So for example, Parti Warisan uh, Sabah uh, is actually just an ally of Pakatan Harapan. They're not a former member of Pakatan Harapan. Uh, while the ruling party in Sarawak, uh, GPS, is actually uh, opposition at the state level. So in summary, uh, basically my argument is that there's no easy answers to this issue of identity politics, especially political Islam in Malaysia. Uh, part of it has got to do with the Malaysian constitution. Part of it has got to do with the way uh, the bureaucracy, especially the role of Jakim. Part of it has got to do with the political parties. But whatever it is, I think the solution will have to come from the Malay community. Uh, the really sad thing is that the Dom Malays are totally shut out of this process. At the present moment, it is my reading that there is no political will to confront this issue of the rise of political Islam, especially the intolerant side, because uh, a lot of people in Malaysia think that this can be dealt with as a security issue. There is also no political consensus. Uh, as to whether Malaysia is really you know, a Malay Islamic state or whether it's a multicultural, multicultural and multi-religious society. Uh, the other point that I think all of you know is that there's actually 
uh, very little moderate voices in Malaysia because they've all been shut down. All current indications and information is that uh, political Islam will be much, much stronger. And I can tell you, uh, within the next one or two months, you see an uh, agreement being signed between uh, PAS and AMNO to formally come together to try uh, to win the next uh, general elections in Malaysia. Thank you. Is this one? Yep. Okay, I think you've highlighted some uh, very interesting facets of uh,